My apologies, I will have to contend that I am the person who has come the farthest today. 200 years trumps anything you have done here. I have come to you today not as a general of the army, nor as the president of the United States, but rather as the proudest sort of a title a man can bear, and that is an American citizen. Even with one who's discovered that his hair is also rather badly damaged by extensive travel. We live in an interesting time. I have had the benefit that I've been through many times and have traveled extensively through all the ages, learned much as I've done so, and I've discovered something as well, that when one passes from the mortal sphere, that legends arise about the type of a man who you were, and sometimes those legends are hurtful because they're put forth by people of ill will. Now, I wanted to introduce myself to you as to who I am based upon who I was not. And so we shall address a couple of those minor legends. For instance, when you read in your books, you'll find out that I've been called aloof and cold, a man difficult to know, too dignified to comport with the average man. Well, I wish you would then think back to the people with whom I rubbed shoulders every single day. James Madison and Thomas Jefferson and Alexander Hamilton, John Adams, and many, many others, Dr. Randolph, many, many people of such nature. In such exalted company, it was only the best, and it behooves a gentleman to comport himself with some dignity and also with a certain distance, particularly because I was most appreciative of the deficiency of my own education and how it did not measure up to such great men as those. I also believe that, as it says in the 110 Rules of Civility, which I studied as a young man, that it is important that a gentleman hold a portion of his own life private to himself and not given to the average world. Among my friends and those who knew me well, I was most comfortable and was able to enjoy frivolity and games and many other things. They found me most congenial companion. It has also been said that I was a hypocrite because after all, here I was a man who led a nation that was built upon the idea of equality and justice for all and above all freedom, and yet I held slaves. Well, that is true, that in my younger life I did own slaves, but those who call me a hypocrite have never looked back to that day. That day. I had been gambling, I had been gaming, as any young man would do, and losing a bet, I had taken a family of my slaves and put them up as property, as one would use coin or any other type of a property. And then I was witness to one of the most difficult things I had seen in my entire young life, as I watched a young family brought to the auction block and a mother bereft of her children, torn from her and sold into another county. And I vowed at that time that I would be the eternal opponent of slavery of all types, of all times of slavery, whether it is the human body or the human soul. And I said that I would never traffic again in slaves so long as I would live neither, neither buying nor selling any persons. I held to that for my entire life until my estate was encumbered with many more slaves than it could possibly support and leave me any profit. And in my will I specified that my slaves would be freed, and not just freed, but each one of them would be given an education commensurate with the times, assured of a reasonable occupation to be sure that they could support themselves, and a parcel of land, and that those who were unable by infirmity or age to support themselves, they would also be given the ability the right to live upon my estate for the remainder of their natural lives and that a stipend would follow them for generations in order to support their children. I hated slavery, I loathed it, and I realized that one day it would be the spark that would nearly bring this nation apart. And they say I was irreligious. I've heard many people say that now, and it takes distance to believe that. You have seen a great painting of me standing in a forest, kneeling really with my horse, that was a daily affair, as Josiah Marble, my footman, would tell you. And it is true also that the Continental Army, each Sunday, was obliged to engage in holy services at the threat of corporal punishment for those who did not do so. And that before and after every battle, every engagement with the British Army, we knelt in prayer. And if we had been defeated, we thanked the good God above for having saved us. And if we had had a victory, we thanked the good God for that victory irreligious indeed. And then I've been called unpatriotic of all the absurd things and the ones most hurtful. There have been people that say that I was only interested in authority and gaining for myself pecuniary advantage. Me. 
who had served for eight years in the Continental Army without pay, indeed spending thousands of pounds of my own money to support the Continental Army to be sure that my soldiers had something to eat, and Martha coming to the camps, cooking for them, caring for them in medical ways to be sure that we had strength yet to fight. And they call us unpatriotic. When appointed to the presidency, a position I did not desire, I specified that Congress would not pay me, for it was too great an honor to serve my country in this way. It took an act of Congress to vote me a pay for that period of time. Unpatriotic. Years of service, indeed, my desire to serve my country continued well past that time. There are witnesses, many hundreds of witnesses that saw me at the Battle of Gettysburg 64 years after I died passed on. I wanted to come back. I was never able to resist the siren call to service of my country, the desire to serve my people that I love so much more than life itself. And that is why I've come here today. I've come because I think we are again in times of peril. In 1777, we were in Valley Forge at a very, very difficult time in our Army's history, in our country's history, but it was a time of the forging of the steel that would eventually give us the great victory that we sought and we won in our war for independence from the great nation, Great Britain. And one night, while I was sleeping, a man came into my room, clothed all in white, with a glory and a beauty about him that I had never seen before. And as I wrote in my diary, he said to me, Son of the Republic, awake, arise, stand, look and learn. And then he laid out for me the history of this great nation to come. And he said that there would be three great crises in America. Three great crises. The first, of course, when we won our independence against the greatest military power of its time. The second, when that great plague and blight of slavery would nearly tear the nation apart. But we would be welded together even greater at that point by that great crisis. And the third crisis, well, that is the one you live in today. And that is why I'm come today. Because the crisis today is greater than any we have ever faced before. This messenger said that crisis would be a time when the American people turned away from their God, when they invested themselves in their lusts, and as a result, God would turn from them, and all the nations of the world would combine in conspiracy to bring down the American people. Now, this messenger said, however, one thing. He said, if the American people will turn back to their God and be obedient to the commandments, if they will look again to the Constitution that they held inviolate and sacred, then all the powers of heaven and of earth and of hell combined would not be sufficient to bring down this nation. That is the time you live in today. Now, how do we know these are really times of peril? What is modern America like today? Having the advantage of travel through some distant times, I have been able to see things that you have not, unless you have paid attention to your books, which were written to give you that knowledge. For instance, in the year 300, the strongest, the most common medical procedure of the Roman Empire was abortion. And what is it today in America? One and a half million times per year? We have engaged ourselves in practices that are antithetical to freedom. We have, for instance, removed freedom and religion from our schools, the freedom to worship God as we wish. Now, what does that matter? You say that has always been the case. If you look back in the textbooks of the early part of American history, you'll find that until about 100 years ago, one of the basic texts used in the school was the Holy Bible. Religion was a daily part of life. It is the duty of nations to acknowledge the providence of God to obey his will, to be grateful for his benefits, and humbly to implore his protection. And what are we doing as a nation today? Thomas Jefferson has been called the great leader who believed in separation of church and state, yet nobody asked him from today what he really believed. What did he believe? He said, there is an indissoluble union that must exist between religion and the government, the state, Else that happens that eventually the people will fall into chaos and eventually from there into tyranny. Religion is vital to the sustainment of a free nation. That is what Thomas Jefferson said. 
Ben Franklin felt the same. So did many others who were even wiser, far wiser than I will ever be. You can't separate the two, and yet we're trying to do so today in our nation. We talked about liberty, and yet today that has been defined by many as license. The difference between the two is this. Liberty allows you to act as you would. And as one friend of mine one time said, he says, my rights end where your nose begins. Unfortunately, that has been defined as license. In the 110 rules of civility I referenced earlier, it said, there's one that has said that when a gentleman in court encounters a lady who is immodest, that that gentleman averts his eyes. Well, that aversion of the eyes as we have it today is turned into a leer. And women are treated as chattel and no better than property. I thought slavery had long ago died. But we have reinstituted it in a different form today. If we are ruled by our lusts, we will not be ruled by God. And it is a truism that men will be ruled by God or they will be ruled by tyrants. When the people lose control of their ability to control themselves, they will be controlled by a higher power. Either it will be God or it will be the tyrants who place themselves over us. As I indicated, we are also a nation that engages in abortion. Today, at the rate of a hundred, of one and a half million per year. One and a half million. Nations will be judged even as will be individuals. They will stand before the bar of God. And every nation will be judged by how it treats its most innocent and its most helpless. And what could be more helpless than those who have not yet entered into the mortal sphere? There will be a judgment enacted upon this nation if that is not halted. You know, it's interesting because I have discovered over time that Satan does not grab you and drag you screaming down to hell, but he leads you carefully down, step by step. Once it's been said, how do you boil a frog? I think you know the answer to that. You don't throw the frog into the hot water immediately, he'll leap free. But what you do is you put the frog into a pan of cool water and slowly kindle a fire under it until the heat rises to the point the frog is boiled until he does not, he does not even know what has happened to it. And that is what is happening to the American people today. And apathy. You know that is perhaps the greatest threat to what we have in the way of freedom in this nation still today? Apathy. Look around you today and see how many people are here. What, 100 to 100 and a half? In a city of a million people? Where are the other people? Why don't they care enough to come out? And yet it is easily amended if we will. You know, if we lose our freedom of speech, we will be led dumb down to the slaughter like sheep. We must do what we can to reverse it. Now, I have heard people say, I don't want to be involved because the sacrifice is too great. It means I must dedicate myself and my time and, my goodness, some of my money to changing the course of American history. The sacrifice is too great, they say. And they say that to me. A man who has stood and seen men die of starvation, collapsing at my feet. I have seen men whose flesh was welded to the ground when they had lain down to sleep and the cold had frozen their flesh to it like marble. We chipped them free with axes and with knives and then we would take off of them their limbs. These men did not have to stand at that point and put themselves in peril's way. They sacrificed themselves and their lives because they desired to do so. Forgive me if I sound at Simon Times, perhaps a bit angry. It is said also among the legends that I was a man of Saturnine temper. Well, I was. That is one of the legends that is true. But it is also true that I followed the rules of civility. And it says in there that a man, a gentleman, controls his passions at all times except when the cause is just. If the cause is just, we need to exercise our passions, each one of us now, to do something about the changes that have happened to this nation. Now, we can follow those bloody footsteps without leaving any blood behind them at all. The individual, you, are far more powerful than you may conceive. What can we do? Well, let's start here. I carry with me at all times a copy of the Constitution, as well as a copy of the Declaration of Independence. And it is also engraven upon my heart and upon my soul. How many of us here do the same? Carry that with you simply inside a pocket or within one of your other devices that allows you daily to reference 
what so many people, millions of people have given their lives and their liberty, their honor to sustain and uphold. It was said that we will surely either hang together or we shall all hang separately. Which would you rather do? How many people understand, as was referenced earlier, the difference between a republic and a democracy? The word democracy is bandied about freely every day, and yet the founding fathers, my friends would tell you, we consider that the most dangerous of all forms of government, for it leads inevitably into tyranny through stages when the people will not stand and understand the difference between them. I will not elucidate now. You've already heard about it. How many understand now that the monetary power, this was also referenced earlier, is no longer in the hands of the people as specified under this document? The power to mint money being under the hands of the Congress, which people are directly answerable to you. Instead, that has been handed over to a private consortium of banks, people who will profit by your poverty. And how many people understand that today? You know, we have an interesting situation. Years ago, sometime I was watching in the backs of other people, and I noticed that there had been an interesting change brought, wherein it was stated in a government document, authoritative seemingly, before the Senate, that the ruling power, or the ruling authority over this American nation was no longer the U.S. Constitution, but rather the U.N. Charter. I'm sorry, I take offense at that. You should too. You should be aware that your own government has betrayed you in that respect. It has been said by yours truly, and it is still true today, 200 years later, that government is not reason. It is force. And it is a dangerous servant and a fearful, fearful master. The more you turn your rights over to government, the more you will be enslaved. The more you will lose your ability to speak freely. So what can you do then? First, become familiar with this document. Get a copy, carry it with you every day. Learn what it means, what it says about all the rights that you were provided by God, not by government. This document is to restrain the government from taking those rights away from you. Next, put yourself into the position of supporting people, as it would be in a republic, who will represent you righteously and protect your rights. This means to vote for candidates based upon the individual, not upon specifically the party. I loathe the spirit of party and the contingents it brought about. A party is a vehicle. The man the individual running for that office, where they stand, what their integrity is, what they truly believe, and what they will do on behalf of freedom. That is where the matter is. And finally, most important, and never, never discount the power of prayer. Do you pray for your nation every single day in all of your ablutions that you normally bear? Do you pray to your God above? Of all the people, I was aware of the superintending providence that gives to this nation life and protects it against the dangers that are expelled in the world today. Pray to the God above. Do not discount that power to support us in our travails and to make us stronger than we had ever been before. You know, my time is near hand. I've got other travels I have to go to, but I wanted to ask to I think consider one thing. Earlier I, I talked to a young lady. Is she out there still? Could she come forward to the stand with me, please? And what is your name? Katie. Katie? Okay, Katie, I want to talk to you about something real quickly. What is that? What do you see in front of you right here? A rock. What is this? A rock. It's a small stone, isn't it? It doesn't look like much, does it? A small stone would seem to have little impact upon things, doesn't it? Right? Right. And yet the fact is, if you take that small stone, Katie, hold on to that stone for me, and put it in the midst of the mightiest river, over time it will change the course of that stream, won't it? What do you see now? Here. A mirror, and what's in that mirror? It's a young girl, isn't it? Most people looking at this young girl would say, that person is of very little consequence. But I want you to know something. Looking in that mirror and seeing that young lady, 
you take this young lady and put her in the stream of time, and over time, that individual, this young lady, can change the course of history. What we do relies upon you. Never underestimate your own individual power. Though you be young as this young lady is, you can change the course of the history of this nation. And it rests in your hands. I am having to leave you now. There's going to be someone else who will talk to you that knows more than I do. And is without doubt a greater person. But this one here, this individual, this is where your future is. This is why you engage in the fight today. To preserve the freedom that they may enjoy. And if you will not stand, she may someday have to kneel. I thank you. One final note about that stone. Will you consider this, please? Sometimes you may discount your own ability to make an influence. Think about this. When you throw that stone into a river, there are ripples that continue out far beyond the depth and the width of that stone, aren't there? Your ability to influence things you will not know in this life, but do not ever doubt your ability to change the course of one life that will change the course of history.